Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing. And today we are going to be continuing to read The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. So, let's get going. I shall live forever and ever. He cried grandly. I shall find out thousands and thousands of things. I shall find out about people and creatures and everything that grows, like Dickon. And I shall never stop making magic. I'm well, I'm well. I feel, I feel as if I want to shout out something. Something thankful, joyful. Ben Weatherstaff, who had been working near a rosebush, glanced round at him. The might sing the doxology, he suggested in his driest grunt. He had no opinion of the doxology, and he did not make the suggestion with any particular reverence. But Colin was of an exploring mind, and he knew nothing about the doxology. What is that? he inquired. Dickon can sing it for the hour warrant, replied Ben Weatherstaff. Dickon answered with his all perceiving animal charmer's smile. They sing it in church, he said. Mother says she believes the skylark sings it when they gets up in morning. If she says that, it must be a nice song, Colin answered. And I've never been in a church myself. I was always too ill. Sing it, Dickon. I want to hear it. Dickon was quite simple and unaffected about it. He understood what Colin felt better than Colin did himself. He understood by a sort of instinct so natural that he did not know it was understanding. He pulled off his cap and looked round, still smiling. They must take off the cap, he said to Colin. And so am tha, Ben. And thou must stand up, thou knows. Colin took off his cap, and the sun shone on and warmed his thick hair as he watched Dickon intently. Ben Weatherstaff scrambled up from his knees and bar bar bared his head too with a sort of puzzled, half-resentful look on his old face, as if he didn't know exactly why he was doing this remarkable thing. Dickon stood out among the trees and rose bushes, and he and began to sing in quite a simple matter-of-fact way and in a nice, strong boy voice. I'm not going to be singing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise, praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. When he had finished, Ben Weatherstaff was standing quite still with his jaws set obstinately, but with a disturbed look in his, look in his eyes fixed on Colin. Colin's face was thoughtful, and appreciative. It is a very nice song, he said. I like it. Perhaps it means just what I mean when I want to shout out that I am thankful to the magic. He stopped and thought in a puzzled way. Perhaps they are both the same thing. How can we know the exact names of everything? Sing it again, Dickon. Let us try, Mary. I want to sing it too. It's my song. How does it begin? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And they sang it again, and Mary and Colin lifted their voices as musically as they could, and Dickens swelled quite loud and beautiful. And at the second line, Ben Weatherstaff raspingly cleared his throat, and at the third line he joined in with such vigour that it seemed almost savage, and when the Amen came to an end, Mary observed that the very same thing had happened to him, which had happened when he found out that Colin was not a cripple. His chin was twitching, and he was staring and winking, and his leathery old cheeks were wet. I never seed no sense in doxology afore, he said hoarsely, but I may change my mind that, uh, in time. I should say they'd gone up five pound this week, Master Colin. Five on em. Colin was looking across the garden at something attracting his attention, and his expression had become a startled one. Who is coming in here, he said quickly. Who is it? The door in the ivied wall had been pushed gently open, and a woman had entered. She had come in with the last line of their song, and she had stood still listening and looking at them. With the ivy behind her, the sunlight drifting through the trees, and the dappling, long, dappling her long blue coat, and her nice fresh face smiled across the greenery. She was rather like a softly coloured illustration in one of Colin's books. She had wonderful affectionate eyes which seemed to take everything in, all of them. 
even Ben Weatherstaff and the creatures and every flower that was in bloom. Unexpectedly as she had appeared, not one of them felt that she was an intruder at all. Dickon's eyes lighted like lamps. It's mother, that's who it is, he cried and went across, across the grass at a run. Colin began to move toward her too, and Mary went with him. They both felt their pulses beat faster. It's mother, Dickon said again when they met halfway. I knowed they wanted to see her, and I told her where the door was hid. Colin held out his hand with a sort of flushed royal shyness, but his eyes quite devoured her face. Even when I was ill, I wanted to see you, he said. You and Dickon and the secret garden. I'd never wanted to see anyone or anything before. The sight of his uplifted face brought about a sudden change in her own. She flushed and the corners of her mouth shook, and a mist seemed to sweep over her eyes. Hey, dear lad, she broke out trem tremulously. Hey, dear lad, as if she had not known where she... Uh, she uh, sorry. As if she had not known she were going to say it. She did not say... Mr. Colin, but just dear lad, quite suddenly. She might have said it to Dickon in the same way if she had be seen something in his face which touched her. Colin liked it. Are you surprised because I am so well, he asked. She put a hand on his shoulder and smiled the mist out of her eyes. Aye, that I am, she said, but thou art so like the mother that made my heart jump. Do you think, said Colin a little awkwardly, that will make my father like me. Aye, for sure, dear lad, she answered, and she gave his shoulder a soft, quick pat. He mun come home, he mun come home. Susan Sorby, said Ben Weatherstaff, getting close to her. Look at the legs, lad, uh, look at the lad's legs, wilt there? They was like drumsticks in stocking two months ago, and I heard folk tell as they was bandy and knock kneed, both at the same time. Look at em now. Susan Sorby laughed a comfortable laugh. They're going to be fine, strong lad's legs in a bit, she said. Let him go on playing and working in the garden, and eating hearty and drinking plenty of good sweet milk, and they'll not be a finer pair of Yorkshire. Thank God for it. She put both hands on Mistress Mary's shoulders, and looked her little face over in a motherly fashion. And thee too, she said, thou art grown near as hearty as our Elizabeth Ellen. I'll warrant thou like thy mother too. Ah, Martha told me as Miss Medlock, Mrs. Medlock heard she was a pretty woman. Thou'll be like a, ro a blush rose when thou grows up, my little bless, bless thee. She did not mention that when Martha came home on her day out and described the plain, sallow child, she had said that she had no confidence whatever in Mrs. Med... in whatever... confidence whatever in what Mrs. Medlock had heard. It doesn't stand to reason that a pretty woman could be the mother of such a foul little lass, she had added obstinately. Mary had, n Mary had not had time to pay much attention to her changing face. She had only known that she looked different and seemed to have a great deal more hair, and that it was growing very fast. But remembering her pleasure in looking at the Mem Sahib in the past, she was glad to hear that she might some day look like her. Susan Sorby went round their garden with them, and was told the whole story of it, and shown every bush and tree which had come alive. Colin walked on one side of her, and Mary on the other. Each of them kept looking up at her comfortable rosy face, secretly curious about the delightful feeling she gave them, a sort of warm, supported feeling. It seemed as if she understood them as Dickon understood his creatures. She stooped over the flowers and talked about them as if they were children. Sut followed her and once or twice cawed at her and flew upon her shoulder as if it were Dickens. When they told her about the robin and the first flight of the young ones, she laughed a motherly little mellow laugh in her throat. I suppose learning them to fly is like learning children to walk, but I'm feared I should be all in a worry if mine had wings instead of legs, she said. It was because she seemed such a wonderful woman in a nice small and cottage way that at last she was told about the magic. Do you believe in magic? asked Colin, after he had explained about Indian fakirs. I do hope you do. And with that, we come to the end of the episode and the end of the reading.
So, thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon, or night. No matter what time of day it is, I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.